during the Neolithic. So we're still talking about the Upper Paleolithic. You know, people, humans are still making a living the same, way, the same way they have been making a living for 100, 200, 300,000 years, and they still have the same division of labor, they have roughly the same culture. So the idea of the order word can be explained now this way, in a formula like this. Elocutionary force, the capacity to give commands, the capacity to enforce social obligations, came before language. That would be a one way of summarizing what Deleuze has to say. Now let me explain that. How do we enforce language today? For instance, when, La when Labov asks himself, well, you know, I did an investigation of all the dialects in England or in, in Britain, and uh, it's amazing to me that this particular version of Scottish and this particular version of Welsh have survived into the 20th century despite the fact that the Voice of London, the BBC, has been broadcasting that particular dialect, the dialect of London, standard English, for 80 years. You would have thought that with, before radio, when there were real geographical barriers uh, making it impossible for Londoners to infect the rest of the people with their standard language, you know, the, 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 the dialects would survive, but after radio and after television and after all these things, how is it possible these people continue to have their own dialect? And the answer, according to Labov, is this. In tightly knit communities, that is, communities in which everybody knows everybody else, word of mouth, or if you want to call it gossip, travels very fast particularly word of mouth about local infringements of local norms. You make a promise to someone, going back to speech acts, you make a promise to someone, that promise binds you to actually fulfill your promise and you break your promise. I'll take care of you, you, take, you took care of my kids last week, I'll take care of your kids tomorrow if you, if you have to work extra hours and then you, you don't show up and the kids you know, do everything they want in their house. Well, the following day, Everybody in the community knows that you, your word is not worth anything, that you break your promises. Or you make a bet. You know, I'm sure the Yankees are going to win, I'll give you 20 to 1 odds. The Yankees lose that night, and you go, hey, and I, was, I was drunk when I said that. And, you, know, you know, come to me I, in a year, maybe I'll pay you. The following day, everybody in that tight knit community knows that you don't pay your bets, they're not going to bet with you anymore. Any dishonored commitment that pertains to the local community is well known very fast and the community can punish you in a very simple way. They don't, they don't incarcerate you, they don't physically you know, hit you, but they can, they can punish you with ridicule, laughing behind your back, or talking behind your back, making fun behind your back, and ostracism, refusing to accept your promises telling you, hey, you don't reciprocate favors, so don't ask me for a favor right now. I refuse to enter into speech acts with you. I refuse to have anything having to do with the locutionary force with you, because you don't reciprocate. You don't, you don't accept your commitments, and your word is not worth anything in this community anymore. And via those two very simple means of punishment, a community, a community can not only enforce local norms, a community can also be a receptacle for reputations, or a depository or a, or a storing mechanism for, for reputations. And, and that is why a lot of people, in addition to just loving their communities and wanting to do the right thing, do the right thing. Because there is enforcement. So what Labov says is this. Language, the reason why language, where very strange and obscure dialects have survived the onslaught of the standards, and survive to this day is because in addition to serving as a means of communication in, in tightly knit communities, they serve as a badge of identity. That particular way of pronouncing the A and that particular way of dropping the S and that particular way of using the second person pronoun, these particular ways of doing things in that particular dialect is a badge of identity. It tells you, I belong to this community. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine that you belong to one of these Welsh or Scottish communities and you send your kid to college to London. He comes back four years later, you're in a pub, right? And in comes your kid, Dad, how are you? And begins talking to you in his new fancy London accent. 
Now, what do you think the rest of the people in the poll are going to say? Number one, wow, how sophisticated your, your, your son is. I wish my daughter spoke like that. Or two, what an idiot. <laughs> Who does he think he is with his fancy London language accent? The fact of the matter is that the majority of times, number two is what happens. And so what people from the dialect speaking communities do is a phenomenon called switching codes. They learn the new, the new uh, accent because they know that in job interviews, they know that when they talk to the police, they know that when they talk to a judge, they need to use the standard, otherwise they, there's the stereotype of the dialect using, you know, a, 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 a hillbilly is going to come in, 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 into play. But the moment they go back to their community, at least if they still want to be part of their community, they switch back to their original dialect. They switch codes. So it is communities as enforcement mechanisms for speech acts that act as the means through which language, through which dialects survive. And then transposing this to 70,000 years ago, we could say that that was exactly the way it happened. Communities had already developed a non-linguistic means using face, facial expressivity, using uh, 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 hands as part of the expressivity, using grunts or sounds that were not in any way linguistic, that is, that did not combine to form sentences. But they had already spent hundreds of thousands of years with a division of labor of hunters and gatherers in which the hunters had to go out there and come back and share the food and, and, and distribute the meat according, you know, to the whole community and then there were already certain duties, the duties of sharing the food that were obligatory. In other words, social obligations, commands in the sense you must do that, preceded the appearance of language. That's one way of looking at what uh, uh, Deleuze is trying to tell us there with the order word. Elocutionary force preceded locutionary content historically. And to this day, it is elocutionary force in its all different, different forms that preserves the heterogeneity of language against the onslaught of standard languages. Now, another thing that is very important about Lavo is that he allows us, he allows us to, to study the, the history of language in more recent periods of our history. I'm going to draw a map of Europe that I need to draw to explain the origin of the different romances, the different, not, the different uh, Hispanic romances, Franco romances, Italian romances, once the Roman Empire fell. It's a very funky map, so if you're going to laugh, laugh now. And then you get it all away. That is Europe. That's England. <laughs> so, let's begin with, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of English, but let's begin with the history of Romance languages. For as long as Rome was alive, that is, prior roughly to the, to the 5th century, before the, 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 the fall of Rome, he had managed to Latinize, he had managed to, to force its own language, Latin, on the masses of just about everybody within that area. And again, this is a very rough map. I'm trying to leave out all those Germanic tribes that did not adopt language and that eventually crossed that line to defeat the Romans. And for as long as Rome was alive and all those roads they had built could carry troops and every city they controlled had Romans speaking the Latin of Rome, then everybody try at least to speak the Latin of Rome. If you had to make a petition to the authorities, if you had to make a complaint to the authorities, and so on, you had to speak that Latin, otherwise they would not understand you. So for as long as there was an enforcer of homogeneity, Latin could be said to be a single language throughout this period. There must have already been variations, and there probably must have already been some kind of switching of codes, but if you ask anybody in, in the area that eventually would become Spain, or in the area that eventually would become France, or in the area that would eventually become Switzerland, the, at least the parts of Switzerland that speak Romance languages, what language are you speaking? They would tell you Latin. We're speaking Latin. 